awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming back on, Kai. It's uh, we've met in well. we've met in person, so this is. I think we could nearly call ourselves friends, maybe. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm so glad we got to catch up when I was up there. That's awesome. Mate, um, what have you been doing last week? Because I know this week you were mentally preparing for a long haul flight, but last week you were hanging out with Malachi, was that right? Yeah, last week. So um, my plan was just to, after the um, goat hunt, to head back up and rejoin my motorbike. And um, I was going to stay up sort of north in Queensland and New South Wales for maybe until April when I have to go to Nepal and uh, suddenly I'm back in Melbourne and <laughs> so I'm uh, getting ready to head over to America. Awesome. So um, that cordage you made out of bark, what's, what's got your obsession up with cordage all of a sudden? You, you Also that goat, you wanted to save its intestines and make cordage. Why cordage? What's, what's the big deal with cordage? Um, you know what, cordage is one of the most underrated things out in a survival situation, you know, like it's up, for me, it's up there with weaving, like I just, ah, both of the things I'm like, I don't enjoy doing, but at the end of the day, if you can make a good bit of cordage, it could save your life, whether it's um, for making a bow drill or just tying a shelter down, um, you know, all of the that I've put together we've used cordage at some stage to just make it a little bit more solid especially when the storms come in so um, it is an underrated skill and people think it's really easy but it's actually quite tricky but my obsession with cordage this time around began when um, a Instagram personality called were the smook he's like this total fire guy he just experiments he lives in thailand and experiments with fire and he had a bow drill with um pig intestine cordage on it um and i'm always up for trying new things and i always want to use as much of the animal as possible when i'm processing it and i'm like genius i can use the intestines for something and um so I thought I would give that a go. I mean, it was, <laughs> I gotta admit, it was one of those moments in my life where I wonder who I've become when I'm standing over a goat, squeezing the poop out of the intestines so that I can dry them out and try and make cordage out of them. <laughs> and was it a success? <laughs> Did you get that? It wasn't actually, but that was part of that was part of the brilliant part of it, you know, like I saw how he did it and then I didn't have any internet service out on my stone cottage. So I was sort of just trying to do it from memory and I got two lots of intestines and dried them the way he said and worked them the way he said and back and forth with him. And finally, at the end of the day, he said his pig intestines were from, were store-bought. Oh. And so they were, cleaned out differently and they were a lot stronger because then he went back and tried it with intestines he just pulled out of an animal and he couldn't get it to work either um so the cordage for the bow drill wasn't successful but then i used the intestines and sewed a goat pouch together with them because they were strong enough to sew they just weren't strong enough to use um, for the bow drill but then there was light at the end of that tunnel because a lot of people were writing to me and then some other people said, no, I know it can be done with intestines that you can harvest in the field. So they've given me some, some tips I'll try on the next animal I harvest. Wicked. No, I was, I was watching with huge fascination. I mean, you talk about catching things on Instagram. I've started, um, I've got split personality on Instagram. I've got one page, which is like outdoors and, and hunting and obviously family and adventure and then my other pages like sports and inspiration but on, on that first page um, I've just started getting obsessed with uh, with carving out these little wooden bowls things I think they call like a goose, goose <laughs> yeah that's him <laughs> 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 oh who was it um, a friend of mine Sean Peach the other day he was carving out one I'm like I've got to make one of those <laughs> Yeah, and then spoons, and you're just like, oh, God, this could, this could end badly. I could be hidden in a, sh in a shed and just, like, fighting. Every time I go out walking home with logs or wood and 
broken branches and stuff. But no, it's it's super cool. And then my other ones, dry aging meat. You now up up there in um, northern Adelaide, you didn't have much chance to get something dry because one there was thousands of flies that it was thousand degrees. Nearly. <laughs> I mean, the dried meat probably would have been a good idea, but I was just eating meat. So three meals a day, you go through a lot of goat, you know. I mean, I it would stay in my esky um, or cooler for three days and it's gone. Mm. You know, I mean, I, I couldn't harvest a really big goat and the meat on those isn't that good anyway. So the medium-sized goats I was eating in three days. <laughs> Uh, awesome. So Adam and I were talking and we did our podcast just after you um, had that success. What was it like first being guided in and then doing it all on your own, mate? It was, it was awesome to watch. Well, it was kind of cool because Jack's actually just a mate. So like I didn't go out to be guided by him. He was just sort of like, hey, you want to come out and shoot some goats? And I was like, yeah, sure. You know, why not? And he just happened to... I mean, Jack Spinks is just one of the most amazing trad bow people in Australia at the moment. So it was awesome to hang out with him. Um, and so we just went out and the first goat I got, I wasn't happy with how I stalked it or how I did it. And so, um, you know, there was a moment where you were like, oh, you know, yeah, that was good and exciting and interesting. But um, then about we processed that goat and about an hour later I went out on my own and that one was amazing. So he just dropped me off in the car and I stalked this um, mob of goats and that moment um, making all the decisions and moving through the bush and stalking and I got quite close to this little nanny and then making the right shot and the right decision um, it yeah it's indescribable um you are you know there's that moment where you realize where your food comes from and you acknowledge that you are taking the life of an animal but it feels so pure to me <clears throat> and it feels so right in such a primitive way um to be harvesting this animal and then using everything you can and consuming it. Like it's indescribable because there's that moment you're like, ah, oh, that is an animal and it's life, but it's so overpowered by this feeling of rightness for me, for some reason. Two other conflicting sort of emotions must be that with patience and control and just pure I don't know, excitement and, and drive. Um, what was the adrenaline dump like once you got rid of that control? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you got to remember, I mean, studs have had a lot of a lot to do with adrenaline, so I hardly notice it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking with mum about it. She said, it's just the adrenaline that you're addicted to with hunting. I'm like, what adrenaline? Like, it doesn't even feel like it spikes for me at all. <laughs> um, I just get... Like, I'm such a focused person, mm. like, step-by-step -step process. So, like, uh, the adrenaline, it's more of a, like, yes, I've done it. Especially because I worked for a year to get to the stage to mm. shoot this animal. Um, that's a long goal. You know, a lot of people set a goal and achieve it in a week or a day or, like, tick it off their list. But... I set out purposely to get to the stage I could harvest my own meat with the traditional bow. And it was a long haul to get to that stage. So I think it was more um, when I managed it, just the realisation of a huge dream. Mm. Um, and... The second one that I did on my own, I definitely, like, I looked back to where Jack was sitting in the car and I had this, like, oh, oh, it's just like, I didn't know whether to laugh or cry or just be in awe of the fact I managed it. And, you know, I mean, Adam and I have spoken a lot about how trad bow hunting is very, very hard sport to pursue. Mm. Um, so just to have achieved that, goal at that 
level at that moment was a bit overwhelming for sure. And, and like Jack came over and, and I was like, God, I was just like hugging everybody. <laughs> no, like, it, was, <laughs> it, was, it was awesome to watch and, and especially knowing and having followed the journey of, you know, a year's worth of, of input and, you know, you've, been really great and in, in tapping into so many different mentors when it comes comes to bow hunting and outdoor or outdoor skills. You know, you're somebody that survived out outside naked and afraid in the middle of a swamp. Yet when it comes back to Australia, you, you're happy to say, "Hey, I'm a beginner." And how how important has it been just tapping into different minds? Well, the thing with the survival realm is you can be amazing at so many things and still have a bajillion other things that you're not good at, mm. you know, like it's as vast and as wide as existence almost to try and predict what's going to happen in the outdoors. Um, so it's most important to have an open mindset and know that, you're never going to stop learning. Like I love Malachi has a saying that you're not an expert at fire until you've failed 500 times. <laughs> um, and it's true. Like you can be the best person at making fire this way, but if you don't have the right stick, you're never going to get fire. Um, I think that's one thing you learn watching Naked and Afraid is like you have these people that are amazing at, at certain things and they get put in an environment that, that doesn't allow for them to have access to those certain things and they become like a child again out, at, out there. So it's, um, I think it's one of the most important things to remember in life is that you can never stop learning and, you know, always to be humble about your skills because there's always going to be a situation where your skills aren't going to work as well. Um, I've just had a most brilliant year with sharing knowledge. Um, you know, like every, every person I've met, we've had this beautiful exchange of like, well, this is what I know and that's what you know and let's share our information. And, um, yeah, so I've learned a lot and been able to also teach a lot, which is great because in teaching you remember how much you actually know. Um, and, yeah, I think, I mean, I think there's no such thing as a survival expert, <laughs> even though it says that on my bio. <laughs> I think it's like you're a survivalist and there will always be something you don't know, so have an open mind with it. That's awesome. You touched on something there about, you know, meeting people, sharing and collaborating with information. Um, and I was saying about my Instagram feed, how I've been trying to sort of curate it. And, and that's where you know, it's awesome. You know, the, the logarithm can work against you and show you things that you don't want to see and, and flood you with stuff. Or you can just kind of, I don't know, find the people that you like and get rid of the stuff that's not giving you, you know, what's the name? Uh, the, the, health, the housing thing, minimalism thing. You can get rid of the things that don't spark joy in you and you can cultivate the things that do. And I think it's really awesome what you and Malachi have done with, with your own little page. What's the response been, been to that, you know, just... It's real nation and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the support has been amazing. Like just the last episode on Facebook had 400 interactions or something. And when you consider it so brand new, that support's very overwhelming to me. Um, so basically I love, so when I got on my motorbike and started traveling, I wanted to, share the amazing people I met with the world. That was like, because there's just incredible human beings out there doing amazing and interesting things. And whether it's only photographing frogs on the Sunshine Coast, you know, I mean, I think that's wicked. <laughs> I want to go and see and I want to appreciate the fact that you, you're doing that, you know. So my goal was to share incredible people and what they were doing with the world. Um, and then when I got to Malachi's, which was sort of going to be my northernmost destination, um, I went and um, sat in on one of his sessions uh, with kindergarten kids. And he showed kindergarten kids how to make fire. Mm. And if you'd asked me before that time, I would have said, oh, it's probably a bit young. 
<laughs> but seeing these four-year-olds make a spark into a piece of char cloth and get a fire going and the delight in their eyes, I realised that, that was when we had to catch them. You know, that was when we could make them love, not make them, but encourage them to love the environment and the things they could do in it or not. And all of these kids, boy, girl, big, small, all were so fascinated with making fire and so fascinated with the artifacts that he takes along for them to look at and so interactive with, you know, like he has this whole table full of flint nap spears and knives and things. And these four year olds are smacking them against each other and just sort of like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And Malachi's like, if that breaks, it breaks. I want them to be able to touch it, you know? Um, and when I saw all that, I realised that what Malachi was doing needed to be shared with the world, you know, like we need to have kids from this age onwards interacting with this primitive living stuff. So um, he had asked me to maybe look at doing a web series with him and I um, and we sat down and hashed out what we thought that would look like and we all agreed, um, like Malachi's... Uh, got Rocky Instincts, which is run by him and his wife, Jess. So it was the three of us collaborating. And we all agreed that it was really important for families to learn how to interact with the outdoors. So although um, the skills we're presenting in being human might be um, the very, very beginner skills of working in the outdoors, um, you know, I know Malachi has got like these incredible flint napping skills and we're like, but this is a knife. So we're, we're sort of, we're keeping it very, very, very simple. But the aim is to show parents and kids how to begin to interact and begin to interact with the outdoors. Because we both sort of believe if we can get people passionate about it, then, um, then people will start to want to save the outdoors and, you know, get, and I believe that, health both mental and physical these days really depends on some kind of interaction with the outdoors absolutely I've, I've just been having a walk on the beach with with billy it's something the thing i love doing on a saturday and sunday and we've just seen you know so many dolphins that we couldn't even count and, yeah. and as, as well as dogs um but while i was out there i was listening to sam harris talk with joe rogan and he's saying about how his wife goes into schools and teaches kids mindfulness and i think you know, and at least not even one year, I think we don't give kids enough credit for how much they learn and yeah. where, their, where their passion starts from. And, you know, you say about lighting a fire, you know, I was so lucky to grow up in New Zealand and every summer go camping on the side of a lake and have to boil the water and so start a fire on a, on a thermid and stuff like that and just, yeah. take, just take it for granted. But now when, when you know, kids come in, into my practice and they've got no passions that I've got no interest in you know especially in places like casino where they've just got the their backyard is this expanse of nature is oh I, I don't know I don't know what's going to happen in in on another podcast we talked about the urbanization of of um, society and the fact that we can't get outside enough and and my job that's leading to all these kids with short-sightedness far and above what what's ever been happening and now Australia is under the same and New Zealand's facing the same thing as what Asia is going through where about 80% of kids need glasses to see in the distance. It's scary oh. stuff. Oh, that's so awful to hear, you know, like, cause that's, that's the sort of hunting vision and the looking out and the finding and the seeking vision, you know, that, that should become natural. You know, I remember as a kid, I was always in the paddocks looking for things. So it's that looking out and looking around that exercises that eye muscle. But you're right, they just wouldn't get that. Yeah. And yeah. Um, what, I, what I was sort of getting there is there, what's, you know, to use a, a uh, simile or a metaphor, the spark in the eyes when, you, when you, you know, you're teaching them how just this, that creates fire and fire creates heat. Heat allows us to grab so much more nutrition out of this food you know what what's that like <laughs> oh it it's like they've watched a magic trick yeah you know like i could sit and watch for hours malachi like make the fire blow it to life and see these like 
Ooh, like the whole crowd. You can have it from the, the four-year-olds to the adults. Like everybody always goes, ooh, like as soon as it, he blows the coconut husk into flame, you know, it's like the magician's done this trick and it shouldn't be that. Like we should know that that's possible. But um, yeah, so, and I love seeing the look on their individual faces when you're like, no, just hold it like this and like, you know, get them to spark that. And my little niece, actually, she's seven. And I've been working with her on using the um, ferro rod to make fire. And um, she'll ask to do it when she comes around now, which is amazing. because She's not really an outdoorsy kid. She'll be like, can we go out and make fire? You know, and um, I think that's brilliant. Like she gets excitement out of watching, like, because I use um, the cattail, which is sort of like a bulrush thing. And it just, when you hit the spark in the right place, it just goes, Phew. So it is like, it's wonderful. And every single time she gets excited and it's about achieving something and doing it herself and something that seems a little quite grown up to be able to make fire. And it's something that most people are probably like, don't touch, don't do that. It's hot. Don't, 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 don't. And I'm like, nah, do it. You can do it. I, I believe you. Mm. You know, I think quite often we don't give kids enough credit for what they can and can't do and we underestimate them which leads to them constantly feeling like they can't do things so you know even just making fire <sighs> brings it to another level i don't know if you saw the strap jewel on the last yeah. insta that i did with malachi yeah i did a watch that yeah so he does that <clears throat> yeah he does that with um like seven, eight, nine-year-olds, and they have made a friction fire basically using a version of the bow drill method. Like, I mean, there's adults that can't do that, and these kids make it and they blow the coal to life and then, you know, like put it in the coconut husk and make fire, and that is an achievement too, like beyond just making a spark with a ferro rod. Absolutely. Um, something you just mentioned, the coconut husk, and not everywhere has coconuts, is that something that you've been doing or experimenting with I guess is just grabbing anything that might look like tinder and I know um, in New Zealand something that I always chuck in my pocket is old man's bed that just hangs on a lot of the, the forest um, yeah. and I just chuck it in my pocket you know because who knows I, I might get stuck <laughs> um, and, and yeah. you, you're saying about how it teaches kids to try and be successful but also teaches them to be patient and that failure is okay and that if you try again you'll you'll get the result and that's I guess what you're experimenting with tinder as well is you know you know not to be confused with an app but <laughs> tinder to make a fire um that yeah. there's, there's so much out there and there's when, when you just think laterally and, and like you said go back to the processes there's so much that you can do with with your resources um is is that something that your niece is now starting to get a handle of that you know there's not a set rule and then this there's a whole bunch of different ways of going about it she was so adorable the other day. She turned to me because I was like, right, we're going to experiment today. Today we're going to try using this kind of Tinder. Um, so, yes, as not opposed to the app, <laughs> as you said. <laughs> Tinder, yeah, the definition of Tinder is sort of any fine materials that you use to begin a fire, for those people listening. Um, and um, I was like, we're going to try a new method of Tinder today. And she turns to me and she goes, we're like scientists. Yes. And I was like, oh, she's like, like outdoor scientists, like we're experimenting with things. And she was so chuffed at the fact that we might actually be like scientists. And I thought that was brilliant because um, Malachi and I were talking the other day, actually, that I don't know there's too many people that experiment to the length that Malachi and I do in the survival realm in Australia at the moment, you know, like there's going out and experiencing but we're actually experimenting we're taking people's theories and we're trying to see if we can make it work for us like um with the different methods of fire making and the different tinders and the different this and that and i never had coconut husks ever like so the coconut husk thing is a new thing for me i would spend ages making a little bird's nest or tinder bundle and so you would get the dry grass around the outside and tie it into a knot. And then you would find finer and finer and finer materials down to like just breaking up um, 
like any fibers that you could find until they were really soft um, and fluffy. So um, this coconut husk thing is really new to me. And I like the, it's just like throwing a coal in that and just being like, voila. <laughs> so I've always had to work really hard for my Tinder bundles. And yeah, so everywhere I go, I'm like stuffing stuff in my pockets. Like there was the balloon cotton bush the other day. I'm like, oh, this looks great. And I'll try that. And there's various Tinder funguses that you can actually just put a spark on and they roll the, roll the coal around. And so I've been experimenting with that just because I know that coconut husks aren't everywhere and I never had them and I'm always fascinated by what to look for with a shortcut in case I do get caught out. I mean, people think that when you make a fire, a friction fire in the outdoors, you have a flame and you don't, you know, so you have to be really careful about what you then do with the tiny little coal that you create. Um, and most people you see, they'll put like effort and effort and effort into getting a coal and then like, <gasps> like you can't just put it under a pile of wood <laughs> on the fire. The actual just as hard part is creating the tinder bundle and getting that beautiful little coal to flame. Yeah, you just did fungus. I was reminded of another Josh James ones. We've got these big, um, I think they're like scallop fungus or something that grow on old, old wood. And yeah, that's another one that he says, if you need something to catch a spark, that's perfect. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, you, you reminded me. <laughs> I feel like such a nerd when I'm getting all excited about tinder bundles and funguses. <laughs> like, doesn't everyone get excited about these things? <laughs> I, I think you're in the right place. I, I think um, the audience I'm cultivating here is a balance between uh, medical science and, and uh, outdoor survivalists. And I think that the type of <laughs> medical route we're going down to is more of this, this slow food. Um, Naturals type of place that I think they cross over really well. Um, speaking of, you, you got re by Pete Evans today because you, you, <laughs> you know, like most things, um, your parents will never listen to you, but if somebody else tells them what to do, then they'll, they'll jump on board. So, well, what's going on there? <laughs> well, I think it's probably revenge for me never listening to them, you know? <laughs> yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> um. I, I don't know, like, um, I've been trying to get mum and dad to eat more paleo and, um, and keto for a long time. Dad's health has been really bad for years and years and years. And the thing that makes it better is no gluten, no sugar, no dairy, no alcohol. There's no way I can ever get him off coffee, but those are the things that make a difference to him. And I noticed that, but they're also highly addictive substances and, you know, my father grew up associating love with sugar. So, mm. you know, like, I know he feels very deprived if he doesn't get his sugar hit. Um, so anything that anyone can do to make their life more simple, um, you know, because it's hard to make recipes that are complicated and this and that. Like, you just end up falling off the wagon. But apparently the new keto book by um, Pete Evans makes it really simple and mum makes a recipe a day and that's what they eat and they have leftovers the next day for lunch and you know it's brilliant so anything that can simplify the keto paleo way for anyone is wonderful although I can never believe it you know people always say oh I can't eat like that it's too hard I'm like how hard is meat and vegetables <laughs> you know like, like I tell you what, when I was eating goat three times a day, there was nothing hard about that. <laughs> yeah, something we, we do, uh, you know, you say it's, it's, you scratch your head and go, oh, I can't do that. That sounds hard. You know, get yourself a slow cooker. They're, they're incredible. But um, oh, uh, slow cook meats are not only full of so many different um, amino acids and, and nutrients, but just so easy to chuck it in and, and then, that's the other awesome, easy thing is like you say, you make a big batch and then you've got lunch. So in our household, we don't really have snacks or, or you know, inverted commas, lunch food around. It's just yeah. dinner from the night before or a couple of nights ago. It's yeah. Yeah, so easy. Um, with, with the goat, how, how were you preparing it? You know, you're in a primitive stove. <laughs> Um, well, you know, I'm not the best chef, um, but luckily I don't need exotic foods. So everyone kept saying, make a goat curry and 
one thing I'm noticing with the sort of cleaner diet is the more spices I have, the more they just come out of my body. Mm. Um, so I don't really enjoy spicing my food that much anymore. Um, like it's kind of gross, but when I went to Nepal and they have lots of like the spices and garlic and onion and that I stank like, and I'm not, I don't smell like I am, you know, people can be on naked and afraid. You could smell my armpits 14 days in after no showers. And I smell like apricots or something like it's the weirdest thing. So for me to actually smell, I'd get in my cabs and I'd be like, who's that? And I'm like, Oh God, it's me. <laughs> so, so with the goat, you know, I was just, um, like I had some eggs there as well. Like there was a day I had a whole bunch of pigeon eggs because I cleaned the pigeon nest out of the roof of the house. But um, so in the morning I would just make some like fry up goat in coconut oil and salt and put some like and scramble it with eggs and that would be breakfast. And then um, then in the morning I would put in a marinade with um, some nut butter, teriyaki and a bit of salt. Um, and I'd put the meat in that and mix it up and then I'd cook a huge batch of that for lunch and eat it for dinner. <laughs> so two weeks of teriyaki meat, two meals a day and salted meat the other time. You know, I, um, I was going to try to cook it over the fires, but the weather was just too harsh to have fires out there. So um, I just ended up doing it on the little burner. Loved it. I, I wouldn't have wanted it any other way. Mm. I don't know if it's... Uh the heat or having just watched, um, I think it's called salt, fat, fire, acid or in some sort of order of that. But yeah, I've been really going after the salt lately and bought two different types of rock salt. Um, yeah, it brings out a new level. With with your hemochromatosis, do you find you crave salt or are you the opposite way around? You're sensitive to salt. You know what? I think it... The last blood test I had suggested that it was not in my system anymore. Wow. Thanks to eating meat. So yeah. doctors my whole life have said I needed to donate blood and I need to not eat meat. And I went almost mainly carnivore paleo and my iron levels went down so much that they wanted me on iron supplements. <laughs> oh, goodness me. Like the last blood test I had, their recommendation was I had to take supplements and eat more red meat. It was, so it went from being through the roof on a vegetarian diet to mm. fully meat and, you know, so it... <laughs> I don't know how to explain it. It's a genetic disorder, but there's no traces of it in my system anymore. It's amazing. Um, I'm pretty sure Sean Baker might want to talk to you. <laughs> I know. I, was, I, was, I follow him on Twitter and I was looking at his stuff today. He, he's amazing. He's really inspiring to me with all the accounts he keeps putting up on Twitter. But yeah, like I'm not, I'm not orange anymore. Yeah, I was um, going to say, you've lost your team. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just the lighting in this room <laughs> i'm still really tired trust me um but yeah it's like um i'm not orange i'm not as tired like two weeks like my muscles you can't see but they're all cut like I just, I don't know, i'm loving this thing but it's i like, and people sort of like well what's your energy like and that, i don't know if anyone out there has tried to harvest a bloody goat on their own all day in 44 degree heat from like getting it in the morning from hunting it to processing the skin and the meat and everything like I've got enough energy to process a whole goat in a day so <laughs> if anyone's tried it they know how much hard that actually is yeah there's something I've I've probably noticed and it's through fasting like at the moment I'm doing one meal a day for the for seven days and I think it might actually be it's not that we don't have enough energy because let's be honest there's so much energy around and there's plenty about people out there with plenty of energy on their bodies but I think it's actually the negative hormone effects that we get from what we are eating like um, in the last 
podcast where I was talking to Gary Fickey, he was talking about his glucose, continuous glucose meter, um, the sort of little experiments he's done. And there's plenty of people out there that have highlighted this. And, you know, he said he had some meat and veg that was left over for breakfast and, and, and some eggs. And then he was working all day in surgery. And then he thought, right, I'm going to try the best bread there is. And because it's continuous, it attracts his glucose all the time. It shot up to diabetic levels and then plummeted back down below what he'd been sort of holding it. And that's when he said, that's, that right there is hangry. And then you, you say about, oh, well, what's your energy like? That's when you feel like shit. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Whereas, you know, and it, 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 I was talking to someone yesterday that I wish I'd known when I was swimming that, hey, you can fuel yourself on fat and that maybe in that 5.30 swimming session you might not need to have you know try to force yourself to eat that banana and honey sandwich and feel like throwing up <laughs> and it may be just a, a teaspoon of coconut oil or a teaspoon of peanut butter or almond butter might do the trick for you um and, it, and it's so bizarre like you say about you know what's your energy like well you know try fasting and see what your energy is like yeah it's, it's actually fine you know yeah. we're, we're designed to do that you know and yeah you look at it, the longest per- somebody, you know, speaking of energy on your body, the longest somebody's gone is 382 days without eating. We're, we're amazing. We've got amazing physiology. <laughs> and I feel that same way about salt too. So we were talking about salt. Like I put salt on everything. And that's one, people have, one thing people have a go at me about. Um, oh, you know, your arteries are going to be so clogged. And I, and I just feel like saying, let's run some tests. You know, yeah. like... Mm, mm, like my mum's worried about my cholesterol with all the fats I'm having. And it's just like, let's run some tests. You know, like my last blood test would have blew everything out of the water from going to eating meat and fats. Mm. Um, You know, and everybody asks me what I'm doing, yet everyone's so threatened at the answer. And that was the thing I was looking at on this Sean Baker thread today on Twitter because I'm finding that the more I do it, the more threatened people are getting by it. And so there was some person on there going, why are you having a go at me for fasting when I'm not having a go at you for drinking Coke and cake? And no one's giving that person who's drinking the Coke and eating cake a hard time. So why would you give me a hard time? And like, there was a picture of this older dude and he looked so ripped, he looked so good. And he was the one that was being given a hard time, but people, you know, people are getting really threatened by this strange thing that I'm doing. And people keep saying to me, you've got to eat more. I'm like, come over to my house. (laughs) And when I've had my third breakfast, let's talk about how much I'm eating. (laughs) You know, it's like, it's not, I don't fast. It doesn't work for me just because of the naked and afraid. Um, Mm. I do the intermittent fasting. Um, You know, is it intermittent, the one where you, like, I'll eat at five and then not till eight the next day. Yeah. Well, it's um, time-restricted time feeding. Yeah, yeah. That, that's and, it. And, and that way is probably, uh, like, so the head researcher on that is Sasha Panda, um, and he sort of says that you're most uh, insulin-sensitive in the morning, so probably eating in the morning is the best way to do it. But, you know. Yeah. Depends that really it. works for me. Yeah. You know, if I start fasting, I put on weight because my body goes, oh, she's gone for 21 days again. <laughs> like, <Is that> a- <laughs> no, 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 no. So the best way I can actually lose weight is to eat a ton, yeah. you know. So I, um, I just, if you, like yesterday's meal, I had, like I had a lamb, a full lamb's brain and a chunk of mince meat for lunch and then three lamb steaks for dinner. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, it's not like I'm starving myself. I'm eating like it's done. Nice. And while we're, while we're on the topic of brains and awesome people on Instagram, tell us about brain tanning. Right. So brain tanning apparently with most animals there's enough brain in their body to tan their hide which i think is like just the most awesome fact like how cool is that they're like this walking this walking thing that has everything you need to process them so um i have tried fake brain tanning before so basically 
the chemical composition of our brain consists of egg yolk, olive oil, and natural detergent, which is another fact that I just love. So you can mimic brain composition by combining those three ingredients. So anytime anyone says something about their brains, it's like, oh, come on now. It's just egg yolk, olive oil, and natural detergent. <laughs> just relax. <laughs> it's like, um, so I've been doing that most of the time. But when I was out with the goats, I had this unique opportunity to be able to harvest their brains and then use the actual brain to tan the hide. Um, I have to say, I had this moment where I'd, I mean, it was a hot day. It's like 40 degrees already, nine o'clock in the morning. I'd got a billy that was so heavy and I'd got it right by the water hole. So I wanted to move it so the, the animals could um, drink still. And I almost threw up trying to pick it up and drag it to where I had to because it was so heavy. But I got it out of the way and I got the skin off it. I got the meat off it. I got the liver, the kidney, the heart. I had harvested the intestines. So I had like poo splatters all over me from harvesting the intestines because you've just squeezed the poop out. Um, and I wanted to get the skull cap for the horns and the brain. So I'd taken the head off and I had an ax and I was like cutting into the skull. <laughs> and I was just like, I was like, who am I? <laughs> it's like this moment, I'm like, what is going on here? Um, but I did, I harvested the brain and then I fully brain tanned its hide. Um, and you just mix it with a little bit of water and um, then go about the tanning the same way. And it's beautiful. It smells like so natural. And I don't know. It's Yeah, it's a really, um, a really good process to know that you're utilising it the way the old people used to as well. Like that's what they did. Mm. And um, who, who taught you that? Um, Josh from the Bush Tannery. So we, I never actually did the brain tanning with him, but I learned the theory from him. Oh, that and Dave Canterbury, um, who's like the Pathfinder guy on Insta, Dave Canterbury. He, um, he had a little YouTube video I watched about it as well. Fantastic. Mate, we're going all over the place. Back, back to eating and, and things. You managed to, and I'm sure um, F-bombs will be probably stuck with you. You managed to basically coordinate an, an ad of people losing the losing the plot over it but what? <laughs> <laughs> so i love f bomb so I mean, <laughs> these, these people that like so there's a few people that are small family owned businesses that i just love their product so i don't get paid for endorsing any of their stuff um, but there's like merchants and swags who made my swag and their swags are handmade and just lovingly the detail on them are amazing. So I love to give it a shout out to them. And then Cooey Snacks do this amazing beef jerky that's sort of all natural. And I mentioned to them once that I love their product. And they sent me a box of it, which I'm just like stoked. So I love their stuff. And they're on Virgin Airlines now too, which is awesome. Yes. I was so excited for them. Like that's the kind of snacks we need when we're on planes. Yeah. Um, but then yeah. there's... Them and, th them and thank you water on virgin yeah. <laughs> yeah and then there's this fat is smart fuel and again you know my main diet when people ask me is meats and fats mm. like that's what i live on most of the time and um so these fat bomb packets are basically just macadamia nut and salt like mushed up together or macadamia nut coconut oil and salt so they're pure fats but like in like just the healthiest form. There's no sugar added or anything like that. And so um, we were, so I have a ton of them all the time because on my motorbike, it's really hard to do lunch. So I'll just sit down at the rest stop, chow down some cooey jerky and then slam a few fat bombs and I'm good to go for the rest of the day. Um, and so we went on this deer hunting trip and no one bought any food. Like, I I had some chops and sausages for one dinner, but we were there like 
like two whole days and one night. We didn't have breakfast or lunch. And so all I had was this big bag of fat bombs that everyone just kept eating. So I was just trying to film people's reactions to them. And Malachi is addicted. But then everyone was just like, just, you know, it's not even staged. That's what I love. You know, like everyone's just like, like these fat bombs. And I just, I just pick up the camera and get their reaction. So, um, yeah, those guys are great. I'm heading to the US, as we mentioned, and they, were, they said, please come to Arizona and Phoenix and visit us. We'd love to see you. And thank you for all the shout outs all the time. So they're such sweet people, you know, like they're the type of people I really love supporting people who are making awesome, wholesome, natural products for the good of the world. And they're small family businesses and they're doing great. So it's brilliant. Uh, it's awesome. And, you know, driving to casino, go through all the macadamia graves. And I'm just like, oh, I wonder if they'd miss some. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, I, I think they would. <laughs> I think they would. <laughs> I'll come visit you in jail. <laughs> <laughs> um, you said you go to the States. How much can you tell us? And, uh, what's the deal? Um, who's, you, your friend, another, as, as we said at the start, you might not, might not need clothes, but. It's going, to be, uh, it's going to be winter over there. I'll be wearing clothes, I can guarantee it. Yeah. Um, yep, Laura and I just take our clothes off and we get paid for it. Does that sound bad? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, my mate, um, Laura Zera, she's a fellow Naked and Afraid participant, um, probably one of the best female survivalists in the world. She's just phenomenal and the most humble, gorgeous, hilarious human being you could ever meet. Um, so we met in the US and at some stage I had to drive my car from the west uh, to the east to be in New York and she came along and we had this wild road trip across the US and then about two weeks later uh, I, I changed my mind and decided to drive it back again. So she's like, yeah, I'll come with you. Um, so we've had some cool adventures in the States and then she came over to Australia for a month and we, um, trekked all over the Northern Territory and Western Australia together. And, um, so I haven't seen her for two years, we figured out, but we've got some adventures that we're planning coming up, mainly, um, sort of off grid bow hunting adventures with the two of us, which I'm really excited about. And, um, she just out of the blue last week um there's some people we can meet with that can help support our adventures so she asked me to come over to do that and then um i think you're going to be seeing a bit of us on insta jumping in a four-wheel drive and creating some adventures over there but it will be survival it'll be it'll be a bit of hunting and a, a whole lot of adventure and laughs i could guarantee that awesome and she shoots a traditional bow as well you know, who's, yeah. going to be, who's going to be better? Probably her. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's telling me about this target range that she has at the moment to practice on with, and it has moving targets that you can shoot at with the bow. And I've never, I've never got to shoot a moving target apart from like the real animal. So um, she's been practicing really hard. She made her bow. So she's, I think she's got a beautiful long bow that she made. Um, but yeah, so uh, there'll be a little bit of competition there, I'm sure, with our shots. Uh, I've been more consistently practicing over the year, but she's been doing it for years and years. So it'll be uh, awesome to get out there and and have a fellow enthusiast like that. I mean, and she's just got such a crazy wild bunch of friends. She was just talking to me and she said, so there's this guy and he's the best um, bow hunter in the world, like best trad bow hunter in the world, apparently. Um, and she's like, he's really excited to meet you. Nice. And I was just like, well, of course. <laughs> no. So she does hang out with some really cool, crazy, interesting people. So it's going to be some good times. Yeah, I wish I could remember what I was watching yesterday. Um, can't remember his name. Is this guy that always goes into Alaska? He was getting some pointers in a traditional bow. Yesterday I was watching. I was like, oh man, this is this is awesome. I should have forwarded it to you. Sorry. Yeah, well, there's still time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you should get Laura on your show. She would be awesome to chat with. Absolutely, absolutely. No, I'm always always keen. Um, and you, what's what's the um, what's the bow? 
hunting community being sort of like for you? Are they supportive or, you know, that surely, surely it's something that just like, yes, another person is obsessed. <laughs> Yeah, there's some amazing people who have been really, really supportive. Um, you know, I mean, there's Captain Bowman on Insta and Jack Spinks, and they're two of the best trad bow hunters in Australia. And both of them have reached out at various stages and, and asked me to come by and, like, and been super helpful with hints and things like that. So that's been really welcoming and amazing. Um, and I think sort of it feels like I came out of nowhere into the hunting community. Um, you know, like people think I hunted to like goats for two weeks and I've actually been asked to be the female trad bow ambassador for the hunting expo, which is one of the biggest hunting expos in Australia. So I think there's a few people that are sort of like, what? She hunted for two weeks. But, you know, they're just not taking into account the years and years of survival hunting that I've done. And, you know, hunting's not just about being able to put an arrow in an animal or a bullet in an animal. It's about um, how you get close to that animal. And, you know, I mean, with bow hunting, you have to get extremely close to the animal. So all the years of my, I mean, I've been an outdoor guide since I was 20, mm. you know, so the years of moving through the environment and watching animal behavior and actually killing the stuff for food in survival situations you know it's years and years and years of that stuff it's just that nobody's noticed until I went out and killed some goats while I was living in a stone cottage but um you know so there's been that and then the community's actually been really brilliantly interested in the using the animal um mm which I'm so excited about, you know, because I think that you can create change to education and people are sort of like, wow, goat tastes nice. <laughs> yes. It's delicious. You know, so now a lot of hunters are writing to me saying they're actually using the meat of the animals that they shoot and they're actually interested in making leather from the hides of the animals and things. So, you know, if, if I can help people use more of the animal and go for a more sustainable life, then, you know, that's just, that's just brilliant to me. It's, it's such a resource, you know, why would you just leave it on the ground? Yeah. Um, Steve Ronaldo will have to get in contact with you. That's I think what meat eater is about is using, using everything up and you might be Australia's answer to Steve Ronaldo of meat eater TV with uh, Kai Fado. <laughs> <laughs> vegetarian for 25 years <laughs> yeah <Yes. All> goats. <laughs> come, come, come at me um what was it like having the balance of and you, you always talk about this when you go from survivalist to then being on um sunrise and, and things like that what's what's you know how do, how do you balance life like that <laughs> Um, it's funny because I almost put a picture of me sitting in my pink fluffy dressing gown on Insta today because <laughs> I just love the contrast you know people just think I go around and sit in the dirt all the time but um, I think it's really freaking cool to be able to go from one to the other you know I've been um, I met this wonderful amazing young girl the other day um, 15 years old can process her own deer, shot her first pig at 11. The family uses all of the meat on the animal, feral family adventures. They make pork and venison sausages. They have a deer farm. They're, you know, incredibly sustainable living lifestyle. And this girl is beautiful and she can drive the manual four wheel drive and wander through paddocks on her own, you know, and, um, and if there was one little bit of advice I could have given her, which I sort of started to, and I will be, you know, I'll see her again, but it's like, you don't have to be one of the boys though. Yeah. You know, you don't have to burp as loudly or be, you, know, <laughs> you can, you can still be everything that's amazing about you and feminine as well you know and I, I love that balance I love putting on makeup and doing my hair and wearing high heels and a little dress you know and feeling incredibly feminine and and that probably the only time I get to do that is on tv nowadays <laughs> or if I have a function you know I gotta, I gotta get start 
dating and go to restaurants or something, you know, <laughs> just, just something and an excuse to, to get my hair done. Um, but, you know, I love that feeling. I love being a woman. I love, you know, even when I'm out there harvesting the goat, wishing I had four times bigger muscles, I, I'm just so appreciative of being feminine and also being capable of doing that. Um, so somebody gave me a hard time a little bit on Insta on my feed. You know, I'm out at Stone Cottage and I don't know, I put some eyeliner and mascara on and the person's like, are you wearing makeup? I'm like, dude, I haven't had a shower for 12 days. I think it's okay that I popped on a little bit of mascara. <laughs> Have you seen my hair? Obviously not too vain. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I, and uh, like Adam Greentree's wife, Kimmy Greentree, she does it beautifully as well. You know, she's just this most gorgeous, feminine, strong, kick-ass woman who also, you know, bow hunts and I'm so harvests. Yeah, and harvested her own buffalo the other day. I don't know if you saw that, you know. Oh, like, a one. Yeah, well, Adam got one, but she yeah. was in there with the knife and helping skin it and harvest it and carry it out. Drag it down the hill. God, that was insane. <laughs> oh, you know, like, yeah, so I, I love it. And I love my crazy life that allows me to have both of those things. You know, like I'm flying to Sydney for meetings with, you know, the ABC and I've got a pair of heels and top a nice top that folds up super small so I can fit it in the saddlebags of my motorbike you know <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah that's yeah <laughs> that's me <laughs> is, is that something you miss about um being in the movie industry is being able to sit there and have someone do your makeup for for an hour or so <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> that was that was that tedious was it <laughs> uh... I just didn't like looking at myself for that period of time. <laughs> you can see why people get really insecure because you start to be like, is that freckle there yesterday? Is that freckle there? Yeah. Oh my gosh. You know, so I just, I think when you look at yourself for that length of time, it makes you start to like think there's something wrong with you. But no, I'm, I'm quite happy out at Stone Cottage, like using my little side mirror to make sure I still don't have any poop from the intestines up in my face. <laughs> <laughs> no, did, um, so what, what was the water situation like up there? It is rugged. So um, at the moment in Australia, we have, you know, places in Australia that are flooded to the emergency mm. level where a metre of water came down in 24 hours. But in the mid-north of South Australia, it's been a two-year drought. So um, my poor cousin, he runs a sheep station up there, had to sell off half his stock. And if he has to do that again, you know, the, the farm's probably done. Um, so he spends all day, every day, shuttling 10,000 litres of water from here to here, from here to here, from here to here, just trying to feed the stock that he does have. And then he's got 300 feral goats on the property just draining you know, just draining his water, plus the emus and kangaroos and the wildlife there. So um, it was harsh. And Stone Cottage um, was basically a ruin that my cousin fixed up with an authentic stonemason. So it was stone with a galvanised iron roof and windows that didn't fit and a door that didn't fit. But there's no electricity, running water, bathroom. It's a single room that 13 people lived in in the 1800s. Um, you know, you couldn't even swing a cat in that room and it was like 13 people, huh? Um, and it had a bit of a fireplace and that was it. So I took in two 25 litre water containers, um, and then one for drinking and one for just general use. Um, but it was 44 plus degrees there. So I was going through a lot of the drinking water quite quickly um, and I would bath in a cup full of water a night like basically enough to soak a bandana and wipe some sweat off and I just couldn't the skins were taking a lot of water to process and that and I just couldn't justify going I mean I could go to my cousin's property and get some of his water but I just couldn't justify using copious amounts so um, 
yeah, water was in pretty pretty hard demand. So I kind of filled up my water jugs maybe twice in the two and a half weeks I was there. Mm. Yeah, I don't know when Mick Mortimer was the other day on a pig hunt, but they were at a water hole and there was, you know, feral dogs and kangaroos around and all of them just got emaciated and yeah, they got they got a pig but far out, you know. And and it was I'm sure that was northern New South Wales somewhere and it wasn't even that bad. But yeah, like you say, um seeing what's happening in Queensland where it's flat and you say a metre of water's come at a farm on a it was in the at the meat works in Casino telling me about the the footage that the, the railways had of just, you know, the water's going up and up and up and up and, and you know, all these cows are isolated on land that's dirt and mud and then they're surrounded by water. So if they don't don't drown, they're gonna starve. It's um mm. yeah, a real sad sad state of affairs up there and you know, it's uh yeah, bizarre bizarre yeah. thing. Yeah. No, I mean I couldn't like all the dams just had skeletons around them and it's indiscriminate. There were native animals too, you know, so can't imagine being a sheep with all that wool, which is really clearly not built for the Australian heat. If our kangaroos and emus are dying too, you know, like it's dire straits out there. Yeah, that's where it's, um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I can't remember what Dorpa lamp sheep is quite good, but it just gets rid of the wool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm sure it's still bloody hot. Um, yeah. yeah. Now, is, is there any sort of other things that you've you've learned over the last year? Yes, I've learned that the most important thing is love that you, <laughs> and I mean self-love, family, friends, the just community, tribe. Mm. You know, like I got on my motorbike in, I don't know, June last year and decided just to start riding north and see what happened. and. The world is an amazingly giving, incredible place. Um, I've sort of redefined what's the most important things, or not even redefined, but sort of been able to put it into words for myself. And I figure that as long as I'm having adventures and I'm happy and, you know, there's an abundance of love in my life, then that's all I need. Everything else comes it's sort of like the whole guy lawrence let it go thing you know like you you're you're living and yeah. that's truly living for me um those three things so that's been an absolute brilliant year of learning for me um and just learning how incredible the people are out there like i just followed all these weird and wonderful people on insta and i would be like hey you know what i'm like two hours away from you what are you doing and that all be like oh yeah come on over <laughs> and finally like someone asked me to come over for a deer hunt the other day and his wife was like aren't you worried about going out with a strange man and some guns <laughs> i was like i probably should be but you know I just have, I don't know, you get a sense of who you want to interact with and who you probably wouldn't. And I haven't been disappointed yet. And I've had some wild and crazy adventures. Um, say yes more, yeah. you know, like that would be a big one because you never know where anything's going to lead. And I definitely in the past have been someone who's probably uh, like, I've been shy at, I mean, shy is not the word, probably introverted. So I haven't really gotten out to interact with a lot of strangers. You know, if they come and land on my doorstep, that's one thing. But actually being like, okay, I'm going to spend a day with someone. I have no clue. I don't know them. I don't know. Like even meeting you for coffee, you know, it's like, <laughs> of course, we podcast. So I knew you were going to be all right. But, yeah. um, you know, I just and really supporting local community people as well you know like um like um creatures um hats um god what's the full name of his account oh i can't believe i've forgotten 
Um, anyway, like I got a hat from him because I want to support a local artist, handmade. I love his hat. So I've, got, I've commissioned a bit of jewellery from his wife who makes beautiful jewellery. You know, support the people around you, find your tribe, figure out what's really most important to you. And I tell you what, I've never been happier. So it's just brilliant. Awesome. Yeah, talk about, you know, supporting people that yeah, think are amazing. There's no shortage of it around here. You know, there's um, Nimbin Free Range who have Wagyu beef and like, they're doing awesome things. So I, oh, I think it's awesome. They, you know, um, sprouting barley and mixing it with hemp to feed to the cows. I'm just like, oh, wow, that's amazing. And got got friends yeah. in the deer industry in New Zealand who also works in feed and he's just like, oh, that's something we've been looking at. And um, then the, the guys at Brooklyn Springs that, you know, they sent us some chicken and it's just next level when when you breed something right it's like having a, you know, a wild goat you just think wow what have i been eating and and yeah. you know, the farm they do an awesome job of, of highlighting you know this is this is actually how farming can be it's it's not offensive it's not you know it's it's not what you see on books over knives and <laughs> it's, it's, no. it's actually wonderful there's also something like so there's this so where I went deer hunting recently, um, so this guy, it's maybe Australian wild country adventures, but wild country adventures for sure. He um, basically has a deer property up just outside of Brisbane and you pay like a really nominal amount to be a member of this community. And then you can go and harvest your own deer for like a hundred bucks. So how good's that? So if you like to hunt, you can just go and shoot your meat and have access to the property 365 days a year um, at, for a really nominal fee. You get your free-range deer that lasts forever. You know, like there's some cool people doing really awesome things. Yeah, I'm pretty stoked to get back to New Zealand next Thursday and finish off the last of my venison mints, which, again, that's my mate's farm. Uh, he's just got – he's lucky he's – one farm away from the the ranges and either side of him's a deer farm and behind him is a massive station so there's just uh, feral deer all through his back paddock it's it's quite yeah. a, it's quite a good good wee spot <laughs> you're heading back there on thursday yeah we're going um we're going back to new zealand for uh for a wedding which is super exciting we're going going to to the beach which you know we live uh, so to Alex, uh, next week we're going to be at the beach so oh hang on we live at the beach but <laughs> <laughs> We still need to pinch ourselves every now and again. That, oh, actually, we live at the beach. Um, and yeah, then uh, having Billy's first, first birthday over there, so it's going to be, like Aww. I say, it's going to be awesome to be surrounded by by the tribe and people that mean a lot to you. And that's definitely the lesson that we've taken away from from being here is, you know, what's important in life is, is those people around you and, and, and that love and, you know, yeah. that, that familiar familiar life. It's, yeah, it's, um, it's been all been challenging but awesome awesome year and is, is that probably something that you know you say about saying yes to opportunities and, and one opportunity creates another opportunity but at, at the same time you've got to get through the challenge of the day and the challenge of the week um to, to be able to be ready for for those opportunities would, would you say that's something that comes about by living the lifestyle that you do um yeah i mean I don't, I don't know. The, you do get through day-to-day -day challenges, you know, but to me, it's really funny. You know, your mate, um, Chris from Uncomfortable is Okay? Yeah, yeah. Um, that quite often comes into my head now because living the life that I've lived for the last six months, seven months, like I've always been okay with being uncomfortable, but it's next level now. Yeah. So I never see challenges ever as awful and I never get upset or bummed or I never, it's the weirdest thing. Like I'd be riding my motorbike and suddenly it's pouring rain and I'm not like, ah, mm -hmm. I'm just like, oh, it's raining. Yeah. And someday I'll be dry again. And like, you just look at challenges completely differently. Um, so I, I, I don't know what, 
would normally be a challenge or uncomfortable is just a fact of life when you're consistently challenged every day. It's yes. just like this, it no longer becomes a challenge. It just becomes life. <laughs> Nice. You're a stoic. And that's, what, that's what I'm loving from Chris at the moment. He's going through um, daily stoic. And, you know, he started because there's a space in the version that he's got to journal about it. And he's decided to then bring that to his Instagram account and, and talk about what he would write down. So it's really cool. And that's what I've been doing when I, as a warm up at the gym is read the day's page. It's, it's cool. Really? That, that topic comes up a lot. Is, um, and I guess that goes along with mindfulness. And that's what Chris and I talked about is that it's okay to have the feeling and acknowledge the feeling, but how it affects you determines the rest of you, like your day or your week. Or and yeah, got you mentioned Guy Lawrence's name there. Um, it's, it's the same thing, you know. Don't don't be bogged down by the weather. You know, weather's weather. <laughs> like it's that whole what can I change right now? You yeah. know, like everybody was saying to me, "Oh my God, how are you dealing with the heat up at Stone Cottage?" It's like you just do. You know, like, is it inconvenient to not be able to go outside from one in the afternoon till after eight? Not really. I just learned some really good ukulele songs. <laughs> and there was nobody there to hear me. Sing. <laughs> so, you know, like, it's just, yeah, I, I loved the downtime. I loved the uptime. I loved the hard times. I, I love, you know, I even loved the failures mm. because they weren't failures, they were just learnings. Mm. So sometimes I think I might be getting a little bit broken, but I'm not like in the, in the mind a little bit where something happens and I feel like I should be upset about it. You know, like I should be, I should be like, ah, oh, damn, you know, like if I miss something with an arrow or, you know, something doesn't go as planned, I should be feeling way worse about it than I am. But I just, I don't. I just am like, ah, okay, that happened. Mm. So, yeah, it's the strangest thing. I'm hoping that's not the beginning of being a psychopath or something, you know. <laughs> Tell me it's okay, Ryan. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Uh, um, it's, I, th I, think it, I think it's the, uh, it might be, be the, the theme for the year, you know, minimalism and, and stoicism or mind, mindfulness. You know, Gary Vee's saying that mindfulness is the biggest, biggest new trend. And you know, like I said, Sam Harris has got an app on mindfulness, Kevin Rose, all these, you know, influence, influential people are, are talking about it. So may, maybe it's, it's, the, it's the way to be. And we've, we've come full circle going back to these traditional ways of thinking and traditional ways of living, slowing down. Who knows? <laughs> See, I was really worried about how, well, me being really worried is I thought about it a couple of times. But I, was, <laughs> I was slightly, I thought about it, um, how I would go being alone at Stone Cottage. Because mm. I'd never camped out alone. You know, like I, I just hadn't, not for many other reason other than every time I was going camping, someone's like, I'll come along, you know, or... I, I was always with a group of kids I was looking after or something. I'd never actually been out, oh, maybe once, but at a campsite, but there were people around. Um, so this was something for me that I'd never been in the middle of nowhere with nobody around. And there are wild dogs up there and stuff like that, you know, especially at the moment. Um, and I didn't play music. I didn't play podcasts. I didn't look like I had no internet service. Um, but I could have played music and listened to podcasts, but I didn't use any of that. Um, and I didn't once get lonely in two and a half weeks. Like I probably spoke to my cousin five times for five or six minutes at a time. Didn't see anyone else. Didn't want to see anyone else. Didn't get lonely and actually cried when I left. So it's like that you, you are 100% in the moment at all times in that environment. You know, I wasn't daydreaming. I wasn't going like, I wish I wasn't here. I just was there and was so completely in the moment. And, and I was hot and I didn't wish I was cold and I was tired and I didn't wish that I wasn't. And I just, and my God, when the goats, 
horns were rotting. It stank all night. I thought I was going to throw up in my mouth, but I, you know, I knew that it was a process that was going on. You know, like it was just fascinating to observe all those things in that environment. It was just such a gift. Yeah, it really taps into that connection that we have with nature and that we are one of nature. One of nature, and yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, when whenever. Uh, there's, there's a hut that I went to a couple of times near where I lived in New Zealand and, you know, you kind of get to the door and you go, I wonder if anyone's here and then there's not. And then you go, oh, this is quite cool. I've got this space to myself and, you know, you're, you're right. You're, you know, you carry your phone with you just in case and, you know, but you, you don't, don't play a game on your phone. You don't listen to music while you're walking in or, you know, or any of that stuff. And I, that might be because you're trying to tune into, oh, is there anything around? But yeah, it's, it's an incredible ex experience. And you know, I think that's why people, more and more people are realizing that, hey, I need to detox from technology, you know, as we speak across technology. But you know, it's, it's a good and like most things, it's, it's, it's about balance. And even when you go back to being this survivalist person and going into town and being on TV, you know, dressing up, wearing makeup, it, it's about balance. <laughs> Yeah, and it was so cool how many people got connected to Stone Cottage. Yeah, like the final video I did where I shut the door and walked away from Stone Cottage, I had so many messages with people I don't even know saying they were crying oh. when I heard Stone Cottage. So it was like it's like people. It really resonated with people. Yeah. Um, people were sort of like how are you getting the instagram stories off if you're off grid but i'd literally have to go to the top of the hill at like seven o'clock at night and walk around with my phone in the air for like an hour and a half but i thought it was important to share what was going on with with everyone out there because it was resonating with so many people on such a primal level yeah. um but yeah people were so connected to the stone cottage it was it was fascinating Awesome. Hey, we've been having a wicked chat and it's always good, you know, and uh, hope to do plenty more and catch up again in person. What, yes. What can people uh, look forward to from you in the next coming months or even year? Oh, gosh. What, what, are, you, what are you Not looking me. forward to? <laughs> what, what's your mindset going forward or something like that? Um. You know, my mindset going forward is just to continue finding the things that make me happy, continue to give back. You know, that's been a big thing. Um, the stunt and film industry can be very narcissistic and very self-absorbed. And I feel like I spent 16 years trying to achieve this amazing goal within the industry, but it was me, 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 me. So I sort of like, you know, giving back, meeting a whole lot of more incredible characters. Like I love sharing what people are doing on Instagram. So you know, like there's always stories about cool characters, but just continuing to fuel my fire and my passions and um, love adventure and happiness as long as I can, as long as I can keep keep on keeping on with all those, I'm going to be incredibly happy. But yeah, Fantastic. no clue. I'll, I'll be on my motorbike. I'll be off my motorbike. I'll be in Nepal. I'll be in the US. I'll be definitely living sustainable living lifestyle and I'll be at a hunting expo which I think is kind of interesting in, in May so you'll find me all over the shop. Epic mate all the best and thanks so much again for coming back on the podcast. Oh it's so good to see you again. Cheers mate.